All right, good afternoon and welcome to our this uh, Talk Thursdays again. Uh, today we're gonna to talk focus on helping restaurants getting back to business. And as you know, that there's a new program for restaurants that are focused on getting them revitalized. As usual, it's the same crew. Uh, myself is Darren Scorpio Campbell. I'm one of the co-founders of Food Artists United. My co-founder, Alex Janaris, is also, he's not on today, but he's uh, my COO for Indie One as well. And also on the call is Peter Yuguno. He is a co-founder for Stars United. And I'll let him talk and tell you about his business. Hi, Darren. Sorry, How's everything going out there? Okay. Sorry Great. about that. I, I got a little <laughs> of myself. No, not a problem. Um, as Darren said, I'm a uh, co-founder of Startups United. I'm also the CEO and founder of Culper Technologies, where we're a residential temperature control, a distributed temperature control system that hopes to give you some smart comfort and energy, energy savings all at one. So with that, let's go, let's go forward, Darren. Okay, and as, as I said, I'm a co-founder for Indie One, which is a live media program, live media platform, primarily focused on independent content creators. So with that being said, um, basically our role for Starters United is we are here to educate entrepreneurs, to find resources, accelerate their business, as well as create the opportunities for you guys to connect with each other. And at the end of the day, we wanna empower you guys to pay it forward to other entrepreneurs to help them succeed in the world of entrepreneurship. Today, our guest speaker, Janelle Hines, she is a deputy director for, deputy district director for the Small Business Administration for South Florida District. And I will turn the meeting over to her now. Great, thank you very much, Darren. And thank you, Peter, for having me um, come on yet again. I uh, appreciate the time that you've given our agency um, to spread the word about the good things that we are doing um, surrounding uh, the pandemic to help businesses to be able to recover from that. So thank you very much. Um, you wanna show the first slide? Oh, this is just our, our logo. Um, you can go to the next slide. So um, today we're going to talk about our restaurant revitalization fund. Um, it is a piece of uh, a program that is um, just created as of the passing of the American Rescue Plan Act, which happened um, earlier in March. Um, we have just a, almost 28, a little over 20 and a half billion dollars for this particular program that is authorized um, to us. Um, it will be available until we have expended all of the appropriations. So we don't have a deadline um, or a time frame where this um, program will be expired. Um, it's, it's gonna based on whether or not we have appropriations remaining for the program. Um, it's not currently open for applications. It will be opening soon, which is why we're kind of doing this outreach tour to let people know about it and, and help people get prepared um, for the program when it does open up. But, Basically, the funds that you receive from this must be used um, for eligible uses no later than March 11th of 2023. It gives um, those qualifying entities a longer period of time in order to expend the, the funding. Um, but, uh, and it's uh, different than our regular loan programs. This is considered a grant program. So any funds that you receive from it do not actually have to be repaid. Go to the next slide. Um, I was just mentioning to Peter before we started that um, the Restaurant Revitalization Fund um, encompasses more than just restaurants. So we want to make sure that um, eligible entities are businesses that haven't permanently closed, but um, they do include businesses where um, the public or patrons assemble for the primary purpose of being served food or drink. So there are many establishments that could be eligible for this. There are a lot of them listed on the screen, but I want to cover them. So obviously restaurants, since that's the name of the program, but it also includes entities like food stands, food trucks, and food carts. Caterers may be eligible for this. Bars, saloons, lounges, and taverns. Snack and non-alcoholic beverage bars. And there you want to think of things like coffee shops and ice cream shops. Um, and then the next ones have to have a, a particular portion of their gross receipts that have to be to on-site sales and open to the public. So the public is gonna come in for those on-site sales and it, all of them have to have at least 33% of the gross receipts from those on-site sales. So that includes bakeries, your brew pubs, 
tasting rooms and tap rooms, the breweries and or microbreweries, the wineries and distilleries, and um, for the inns, it's food and beverages together that will um, comprise the 33% of gross receipts. Um, licensed facilities or premises of a beverage alcohol producer, or the, again, the public may taste, sample, or purchase products, and other similar places of business in which the public or patrons, again, assemble for the primary purpose of being food, served food or drink. Um, so you wanna make sure that you, if you meet these criteria, it does mean that you are eligible to apply for the program. Go to the next slide. Now, how much you're eligible for is, is dependent on what your business has been generating, but the maximum amount is $5 million per location, not to exceed a total of $10 million for the applicant and any affiliated businesses. Minimally, the award amount has to be at least a minimum of $1,000. So somewhere between those two ranges is, is where many of our, our small businesses that can uh, be eligible for this program will fall. Go to the next slide. Okay, this program is a little bit different from our other programs. Um, you know, if you've come to um, Startup United's uh, events like this, you've seen me a couple of different times talking about other programs that we have that are centered around our uh, pandemic response. So um, it's, this program is a little bit different in that um, different from our shuttered venue operators grant, which I talked about last time, um, the applicant for this particular program will not need to be registered in SAM.gov. And you also will not be required to provide a DUNS number or a CAGE number identifier. Um, and again, similar to what we have with our PPP program, we will accept valid individual taxpayer identification numbers um, as long as they are unexpired. So that would mean that um, owners that are not necessarily, that are legal residents here, but not necessarily US citizens will be eligible for this. And they may not necessarily be able to provide a social security number. We've provided the links below as to what actually comprises an individual taxpayer identification number. And there's FAQs regarding the expiration and how to get them um, back to being uh, valid uh, pieces of identification. Go to the next slide. There are some entities that will not be able to apply for this particular program. So we wanna talk about those that may not be eligible. Um, all of them that are listed here would be considered ineligible as long as part of it applies to them any one of these bullet points would be considered an ineligibility point. So if your entity is owned um, by, a, is a state or local government operated business, there we're thinking maybe of a um, county museum that also you know, operates some concessions at the same place, but is not um, contracted out to a small business, but the, um, the local municipality actually operates the business. That wouldn't be eligible. Um, as of March 13th of 2020, they, the entity would own or operate together with any other of its affiliated businesses, more than 20 locations, regardless of whether those locations do business under the same or different names or are in different industries. So again, no more than 20 locations um, would be eligible for this program. Um, if you have a pending application for or have received the shuttered venue operators grant, it would disqualify you from being able to apply for this program. Also, if you are a publicly traded company, if you're permanently closed, if you are a nonprofit organization, or if you have, can determine that the calculation of the amount of funding for this program would be at, um, less than $1,000, any of those items would also disqualify you from applying for this particular program. Go to the next slide. Who is eligible? So we wanna continue in that vein and there's many different forms of uh, um, organization that will be eligible for this. It includes um, the corporate structure, such as a C corporation or an S corporation. Partnerships are eligible. Our LLCs are available. Um, sole proprietors, self-employed individuals, independent contractors, tribal businesses, and your LLC. But again, you have to designate whether or not you're taxed as an S corporation or as a sole proprietor. Um, so almost any entity that you can think of would be eligible to apply for this particular program. Go to the next one. Um, there is a question about whether or not franchises would be eligible for this. And the, the answer is yes, your franchise would be eligible. However, we have um, a requirement that the franchise has to be listed on the SBA franchise directory. 
We actually have an ongoing directory that lists those franchises that SBA have deemed eligible for our programs. Now, that doesn't mean if your franchise is not listed that you can't apply. It just means that you need to get it listed onto the directory first prior to submitting your application for the restaurant revitalization fund. And there's information at the bottom of the screen on how to do that. Basically, you would just um, send an email to franchise at sba.gov with your franchise documents, and they will review it and look and see whether or not it meets SBA's eligibility criteria. Go to the next slide. Um, bankruptcy. Um, again, if you are in um, a bankruptcy, it may or may not determine whether or not you're eligible for the program. Um, our regulations state that applicants that are operating under an approved plan of reorganization, whether that's under chapter 11, chapter 12, or chapter 13 bankruptcy, and as long as they meet all the other requirements, they would be eligible for the funding. However, um, if you are permanently closed, I had mentioned that already before, or if you have filed a chapter seven liquidation bankruptcy, or you filed for the chapter seven, chapter 11, chapter 12 or chapter 13 bankruptcy, but you're not yet under an approved plan of reorganization. Um, those would make you ineligible for this. And again, we wanna make sure that the determination is that you don't realize that the permanently closed definition means that um, if you're temporarily closed um, because uh, of state or local restrictions or other pandemic causes, that doesn't mean that you're permanently closed. Um, you have to still be able to be in operation or to have reopened but it, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily permanently closed if you were temporarily closed or are temporarily closed because of that. Go to the next slide. Um, how do other relief programs that SBA is offering, how will they impact the RRF and your eligibility for it? So um, one of our programs that we've rolled out um, since uh, the CARES Act is our Paycheck Protection Program, what we call PPP. Um, if uh, any funds that you've already received under that program, um, are required to be subtracted from your final funding amount. Um, and we're going to use um, our systems to ensure that um, we know who it is that has already gotten the PPP loans. So we'll be using the EIN numbers, the ITIN numbers I mentioned before, and our social security numbers that are associated with the PPP loans. Um, now, if you have received the PPP loan already, then you have to use the same EIN number with your RRF application that you used with the PPP application. You're required to do that. If you applied for the first draw loan for multiple locations under one EIN, and you subsequently applied for a second draw loan under different EINs, then you have to provide the EINs, the EINs for each entity that received a second draw loan. We need to know and you need to disclose how much of the PPP funding your business has already been able um, to receive. Um, upon applying for the RRF, if you have an outstanding PPP application that hasn't yet been approved, you need to withdraw that because you, 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 want, you need to go either all the way through the process so that you have an approved PPP loan and then apply for RRF, or you're going to choose to apply for RRF, and then you'll have to withdraw any of your outstanding PPP loan applications. Um, you can't also have a pending application for or have received, again, a shuttered venue operator grant from SBA. Those two programs do have an interaction, if you will, with the Restaurant Revitalization Fund. Go to the next slide. Um, the other thing that you have to attest to, which is true for all of our programs, um, all applicants for those um, uh, programs that we rolled out because of the coronavirus pandemic, um, the applicants have to certify that the current economic uncertainty makes this funding request necessary to support the ongoing or anticipated operations of the business. Um, it's a portion of the application that you actually have to attest to. So be aware that that's something that is required for all of our programs, but it's also for the RRF program. Go to the next slide. Um, everyone wants to know though, how can I use the funding? Once I know how much I'm eligible for, how can I actually use it? And it's got a pretty wide use of funding. Um, you can use it for business expenses, um, including payroll costs, um, utility payments or maintenance expenses, um, your business supply expenses, including if you have to buy um, PPP, protective equipment or cleaning materials because of COVID. You can use it for your business food and beverage expenses, including 
raw materials, if you're actually taking raw materials and creating um, like your own dishes or something like that from that, um, your covered supplier costs and your business operating expenses. So typically that includes things like insurance, your marketing, um, your fees, licenses, legal, and your point of sale equipment. Um, you can use it for construction expenses if it is related to the construction of outdoor seating. Um, however, we want to make sure that you know that um, other expansion costs are not going to be considered eligible or are going to be considered ineligible. So it's not to go and get an additional location. Um, it's, it's more to retool your business to fit within those COVID requirements. Um, and different from some of our other programs, you can pay some business debt with this, um, whether that is a mortgage obligation, meaning both principal and interest, or it could be debt service, whether it's unsecured or not. Again, principal and interest payments are eligible but we want to highlight that you're not to use the funding to make prepayments on those um, business um, obligations. So that's the only thing is you can't pay off a debt and you can't prepay a debt, but you can handle the normal monthly um, business debt payments that you have um, in, in, with this particular program. Go to the next slide. Um, I mentioned before that there is an extended covered period for this particular program, but the question is always asked, when do I have to use the funds by? So um, you have to have uh, used the uh, money spent on expenses that were either um, were incurred between February 15th of 2020 and March 11th of 2023. So it's both backward looking and forward looking for this covered period. Um, now, if you're permanently closed or if you do permanently close after you have received the funds, then you won't be able to go out to the entire length of March 11th, 2023 for your covered period. Your covered period will end as of the date that your business permanently closed. So whichever one is sooner is, is what's gonna be the guiding um, uh, end date for your covered period on that. Um, if you have funds that are not spent on eligible expenses by the time that covered period ends, then you are gonna be required to return those um, funds to the government. Go to the next slide. Um, we're continuing in the same vein as to when do I have to use the funds. So there will be a use of funds assessment. So after the total award funds have been exhausted by the business, um, the businesses will be must provide a detailed expenditure report and certification for the required period, that covered period where you expended the money. Now, until you actually complete that use of funds assessment after the exhaustion of all of your funds, then beginning in December of 2021, applicants are going to be required to provide self-reporting unaudited data detailing the use of the distributed funds each year through 2023. So you'll do it for 2021, you do it for 2022 on to the end of that covered period as long as you're eligible to go through the entire covered period um, through March 11th of 2023. So until you exhaust it all and have to do that use of funds assessment, there will be a yearly reporting by you. You're going to self-report it um, in an unaudited fashion um, on how much of the money you have expended each year. Um, we're going to provide some additional guidance around this. So this is a brand new program. Um, it just got created at the beginning of March. We're getting ready in a few um, days and or weeks to actually open the program for applications. So a very, very quick stand-up. And uh, you know, as you noticed on some of our other programs, we have um, additional guidance that keeps rolling out. Um, we have a website for this program already. We don't have FAQs yet, but I believe that that will be coming. But we will give you that additional guidance on what's actually required for this reporting uh, requirement on this program. Go to the next slide. Now, someone wants to know, obviously, how do I calculate how much I can get from this? And um, we've heard the minimum amount is $1,000. Maximum amount, if you have more than one location, can be up to $10 million. So we've offered three different types of calculations that you can utilize, and they are contained out on our application forms on our website. But um, the first calculation is for those businesses that have been in business the entire year prior to or on January 1st of 2019. So you operated for the entire year of 2019, and um, you can use calculation number one. It's, it's fairly simple. You're going to use your 2019 gross receipts you're going to subtract out your 2020 gross receipts, and you're also going to subtract out any loan amounts that you have under PPP. That includes first draw and second draw, 
and there is not a difference as to whether or not you've actually gone through the forgiveness process. So the overall total amount of your forgiveness is, I mean, your um, PPP loans is what you're going to um, have to subtract out. Go to the next slide. Sorry, I'm going to turn my light on again. Okay. So the next slide uh, is the calculation number two. Um, this is for applicants that began operations partially through 2019. So you were not open and operating as of January 1 of 2019. You, you know, started your business or began operations sometime with, um, within the year of 2019. Now you'll notice that there's a, a caveat on this, that um, if you are in that situation where you were not in uh, business for the entirety of 2019, you get to choose between using this calculation, calculation number two, or calculation number three. Um, however, we want you to know that if you do choose calculation number three, it could require longer processing times. So this one is based on um, a determination of what your average 2019 monthly gross receipts will be. You have to determine that amount. You're gonna multiply that by 12 so that you can get a yearly amount. You're again going to subtract out the 2020 gross receipts, and you're gonna subtract out the total of your PPP loan amounts. All of that has to happen. And we go on to the next slide, which is calculation number three. So again, these are for um, businesses that were not in, um, you can use this calculation if you were not in business for the entirety of 2019. Um, it's also for applicants that began on operations on or between January 1st of 2020 and March 10th of 2021. And again, uh, those that had not yet opened, but maybe have incurred eligible expenses as of March 11th of 2021. Um, so this one is based more on those eligible expenses. So you're gonna take the total amount spent on your eligible expenses between February 15th of 2020 and March 11th of 2021. That will be the base amount. You're gonna subtract out again your 2020 and this time your 2021 gross receipts as well, and then also subtract out the PPP loan amounts. And again, I know this sounds very convoluted. Um, you don't have to go and do these calculations on your own. If you have a tax professional or somebody else that is maybe a bookkeeper or an accountant, you can rely on them to assist you. Um, we also have our resource partner network, which I'm going to mention a little bit later on how to get in contact with them, but they stand ready to help you with this application process and to figure out what your potential fund amount would be. Go to the next slide. How do you apply? So we have a couple of different ways that you'll be able to do the application for this particular program. Um, we will have a SBA platform at restaurants.sba.gov. It's not open yet. We haven't opened the program, but that's where it will be contained at. Additionally, if you use a point of sale vendor, you can look and check with your vendor and see if they are going to partner with SBA to accept those applications. Some will, some won't. We're working with many of them right now so that we can get an agreement in place um, to allow them to take the applications. Um, additionally, we are standing up a telephone call center and the phone number is listed on the screen, 844-279-8898. Um, they will have the ability to answer questions about the program but also to take um, applications over the phone. Although you need to be aware that, you know, there may be longer processing times if you actually apply over the phone. But we wanted again, to make sure that this program could be accessed by people that maybe have some problems with broadband um, availability. So the telephone application is a new thing for us to start doing, but we wanted to make sure that we could give access to those that may not be able to do the traditional online platform. Um, the other thing I want to mention about our telephone call center is that they are offering um, assistance in languages other than English. Um, they're going to be how, um, staffed by people with many different language capabilities. So you'll be able to discuss um, this particular program in the language of your choice. Go to the next slide. Okay, what documents do I need in order to apply? This is very similar for, for everybody else. This particular um, slide applies to all applicants. The first one is obviously our application form. Um, it will be an online form that you can submit when we actually open up that application grant platform. But right now we have a copy of the form out on our website, sba.gov forward slash restaurants. 
and you can go out and kind of see what it is that you're going to have to be required to sign and attest to when you look at the application. The other thing we'll need is um, the ability to verify your tax information. Um, the IRS form 4506T is required. Um, you can complete it online again at the SBA grant platform and, uh, or you can um, provide it to us um, in, in some in other ways. Um, we have a gross receipts documentation that's gonna be required. Again, the basis of the loan is your gross receipts for 2019, 2020. So we need to make sure that you're providing us that documentation. And there's a couple of things uh, listed on the screen that we will actually take for that. Um, uh, it could be a business tax, re re tax return, which would be your 1120 uh, IRS form or the 1120S. We will take um, an IRS form 1040 Schedule C, or if you're a farming entity, the 1040 Schedule F. For a partnership, we're gonna typically look for, again, the partnership's IRS form 1065, including the K-1s. We will accept bank statements, internally or externally prepared financial statements, such as an uh, a income statement or profit and loss and a balance sheet. And of course, a point of sale report, including the IRS form 1040K. All of those will be eligible forms um, of uh, documentation to provide to us. Let's go to the next slide. Now, in order to apply, it will depend on what calculation you used as to what documentation you're going to give to us. So if you're gonna use calculation one or two, again, those are the ones that have the basis for the gross receipts. What you're gonna give us are the information that we had on that previous slide, the, the application form, the 4506T, your gross receipts for 2019, your, um, and three months of bank statements, your 2020 gross receipts, and we're gonna need at least one of the ones that are listed here on the screen. We have both the preferred method, which would, or preferred documentation, which would be the, the federal tax returns that are filed or your point of sale report. We'll also have something that we consider to be acceptable, but it may delay your review for um, past the 14 days. So those would be those internally or externally prepared financial statements, such as the income statement or profit and loss statements, and they need to be signed, dated and certified to as to the accuracy by the ap applicant. Let's go to the next slide. This one's really hard to see because there's a lot on it. But again, this is for calculation number three. And this is for those that um, are more um, basing their loan, uh, their grant amount um, or fund amount on the eligible expenses that they have um, for their business. So again, same thing as before the, the application form, the 4506T, three months of bank statements. Um, you're going to need the 2020 and 2021 gross receipts for at least one, uh, one for each year. And again, we have the preferred um, documentation, which is the 2020 federal tax returns filed or 2020 federal tax returns prepared, but not yet filed. They have to be on the actual IRS forms though. Um, the 2020 point of sale reports, your 2021 point of sale reports as well. Eligible expense documentation, again, we'll take at least one of these and um, the required appropriate supporting documentation for those um, eligible expense types. One, the preferred is the CPA comfort letter, which provides fastest SBA review. If the applicant submits the expenses related to the following categories, the appropriate documentation would be payroll documentations, typically your 941s. It would be outdoor seating expenditures, such as invoices and payments, and your business debt. Um, there, we're typically looking for a lender loan statement. Um, acceptable, um, documentation, but that, that may delay the um, application process would be again, those internally or externally prepared financial statements have to be signed and certified by the, the applicant. Um, or if you want, um, you can submit expenses related to the following categories, uh, same as before. The payroll documents of 941s, outdoor seating expenditures, um, invoices and payments, and the business debt. Again, the lender loan statements are what we're looking for. Go to the next slide. Um, continued. <laughs> uh, there's going to be a lot of documentation. Obviously, this is a grant program. We've got to make sure that we've got eligible um, uh, people that we're assisting. So in addition to the documents on the prior slides, if you are a brew pub, a tasting room, a tap room, a brewery, a winery, a distillery, or a bakery, you have to provide additional documentation that shows that you have on-site sales open to the public that comprise at least 33% of the gross receipts for 2019. 
there's some additional documentations, but if you were for businesses that were only opened in 2020, then what they're looking for is your um, original business model. Here, I would think business plan and that plan or business model should have contemplated at least 33% of gross receipts in that online sale to the public area. If you're an in, again, you're still going to have the same thing. You're going to have to provide documentation that you have on-site sales of food and beverage that are open to the general public at your location. And they again, comprise at least 33% of your gross receipts for 2019. If you're a business that only opened in 2020, again, we're looking at the original business model and it has to show that that was at least contemplated that at least 33% of your gross receipts would be from on-site sales of food and beverage to the public. Go to the next slide. I mentioned before that um, there is help that's available to you. So um, the hotline, the, the call center that's gonna be um, stood up for this already has a phone number assigned to it. You can always already answer questions to it. Um, you can contact your local office, which is my office here in the Miami area. Um, but that website also will get you in touch with our resource partner network. I mentioned that they stand ready to help you with these types of applications. We have our SCORE chapters, our small business development centers, and our um, women's business centers, and our veteran business outreach center. Um, again, the call center has help available in multiple languages. So you don't have to feel like you have to speak only English if it's not something that um, you're most familiar with. Go to the next slide. Okay, best practices. Um, we haven't even rolled out the program, but we do have some um, ideas and uh, topics we want to discuss with you to make you more successful at this. First of all is to provide completed documentation. Um, if you give us an application that is not in fact complete and doesn't have all the documentation that's required, it will be rejected. And the review process will then restart when you've actually provided that completed documentation. So you don't want to have delays in this program. We expect that it will be a very competitive grant program. So you don't wanna jeopardize your slot in line with not having a uh, complete process. Um, the other thing is to leverage your resources. Um, while again, it's not required, you, do, you can do all of this documentation and the application by yourself, you may want to use um, the use of a CPA or other accounting professional if you have one that is working with your firm in order to make sure that you are completing it and have a well-documented application. Um, application corrections. Um, we at the SBA will not be able to make corrections on your behalf as an applicant. The only one that will be able to do that is you, and you'll be required to make those um, corrections by contacting the call center hotline. Again, that can delay the processing of your application. Um, you also, um, do uh, applicants who still intend to apply for PPP. Again, if you're applying also for the restaurant revitalization fund, then you're advised to get your PPP application completed in advance of getting the RRF application. If you apply for the RRF application, then you are required to withdraw any pending PPP applications. So it, it's one or the other right now um, because we wanna make sure that we are subtracting the to total amount of your PPP loan assistance. Um, so if you have one that's in process, it would have to be withdrawn in order to go forward with the RRF application. Go to the next slide. When can you apply? So again, as I mentioned, we're not taking applications yet. In fact, um, we will actually have um, a pilot period or a testing period um, where we um, will have um, participants who have been randomly selected from existing PPP borrowers who have self-identified as members of our RRF priority group. And we're gonna talk about that on the next couple of slides, but um, these participants are not gonna be able to receive funds until we actually open it up to the public, but they're gonna help us to test this application site out and make sure that we um, have a, a program that will work for all of our applicants. So after that um, pilot period, we're going to open it up starting day one. Um, and we're going to open it for a 21 day period that's called the priority period. During that 21 day time frame, we are only gonna be, we, we can accept applications from anybody that's eligible, but the only applications um, that will be funded during this period will be from small businesses that are owned by women, veterans, and socially and economically disadvantaged applicants. 
So everybody can apply starting day one. The only ones that will be funded for the first 21 days are if your business is owned in a majority by women, veterans, and socially and economically disadvantaged applicants. So just be aware of that. On day 22, then every eligible application that we have received will be processed in the order that it was received and funded until we have run out of all of the money appropriated for the program. Go to the next slide. Um, I mentioned the priority groups. So now the question is, what are the priority groups? So um, a small business concern that is at least 51% owned and the management and daily operations of the applicant are controlled by one or more individuals who are women, veterans, or socially and economically disadvantaged. So we have to have businesses that um, these, these entities will be funded during that priority period, the first 21 days. Um, everyone can apply for the first 21 days, but only the ones that meet this priority group will be funded during the first 21 days. You will certify as the applicant that you meet those eligibility requirements. And we've given an example because we know that there are a lot of businesses out there that have more than one owner. So in our example, we have an applicant that has five owners who each own 20% of the applicant. Two of those owners are veterans and one owner is a socially and economically disadvantaged individual. We as an agency will consider that this applicant will, does meet the requirement that at least 51% of the applicant is owned by a priority group because we're going to add together the two owners that are veterans at 20% and the one owner who is socially and economically disadvantaged at 20% to make 60% ownership. Go to the next slide. Now, the other question is, what is the definition of socially and economically disadvantaged individuals? So we're gonna start with the socially disadvantaged first. Socially disadvantaged individuals are those who have been subjected to racial or ethnic prejudice or cultural bias because of their identity as a member of a group without regard to their individual qualities. Now, individuals who are members of the following groups are presumed to be socially disadvantaged already by the SBA. Those include Black Americans, Hispanic Americans, Native Americans, and those include Alaska Natives and Native Hawaiians, Asian Pacific Americans, or subcontinent Asian Americans. Those are all presumed to already be socially disadvantaged. Now, the economically disadvantaged individuals are those socially disadvantaged individuals whose ability to compete in the free enterprise system has been impaired due to diminished capital and credit opportunities as compared to others in the same business area who are not socially disadvantaged. So you have to meet the social disadvantage criteria first and then move on to whether or not you can um, certify that you are also economically disadvantaged. Now, these are the definitions we've been given so far there may be some additional guidance coming up that will flesh these out a little bit more, but this is what we're dealing with right at the moment. Go to the next slide. Oh, we wanna make this um, pretty clear. Um, make sure that you as an entity do not reorganize for the purposes of trying to qualify for the priority period because it will result in automatic disqualification of the award. So you don't want to change your ownership status of your business in order to get into that priority period it will automatically disqualify you from the award. So please don't do that. Go to the next slide. So funding set-asides. We want you to know that we are doing um, the most that we can to ensure that those um, that are smallest businesses will get um, you know, a, a nice big portion of the amount of allocation that we've given. So we have designated the first three funding set-asides that are on the screen. So we have 5 billion set aside for applicants with 2019 gross receipts of not more than $500,000. We have an additional 4 billion that is set aside for applicants with 2019 gross receipts from half a million up to a million and a half. And we have additional 5 million set aside for applicants with 2019 gross receipts of not more than $50,000. So we have obviously reserved the right to change these levels, but um, for the most part, we want to make sure that those um, that are smallest and hardest hit will be able to access the program. We don't want um, others to you know, gobble up the money real quick and then they won't be able to have um, access to it. Go to the next slide. Okay, home stretch. Now we're talking about local resources. So we at the South Florida office, we do have our own um, website, which is the first link that's listed on this slide, sba.gov forward slash South Florida. Um, we have a lot of different um, 
resources and um, information out there. But one of the things we do have is our virtual um, web calendar. It includes not only the things that we are doing as a district office, as far as webinars and virtual office hours, but it does include trainings and seminars um, that are offered by our resource partners as well um, on a variety of topics. Not all of them are necessarily COVID related. Um, the other thing I mentioned before was the website for how to find some local assistance. If you wanna do sba.gov forward slash local hyphen assistance. Um, and that's where you'll find not only our district office, but our resource partners as well. All you have to do is put in your zip code and a mapping tool will populate and show you who is closest to you. I do want to mention though, that our office is currently not open to the general public. We are still doing 100% telework because of the pandemic. But uh, some of our resource partners have opened up to in-person uh, meetings. Um, we do also have a YouTube channel for the SBA um, South Florida District Office. And it's a long website, so I typically don't read it off, but if you do um, an internet search for SBA South Florida District YouTube, it will typically pop up as one of the first things that you'll find in your internet search. Um, we're constantly putting new content out there. So, um, you know, please try to go there, follow it and, and, and stay in tune with what our office is, is providing as content. Go to the next slide. Okay, best way to find out what's happening with this uh, particular program and our other programs is to stay connected with SBA. Um, so we provided you some connections here on this slide um, to help you stay in contact with us. Um, our agency has an e-newsletter at least once a week, if sometimes more depending on when these programs change, but at least once a week, you will receive an email from the SBA telling you what's new with the SBA. You can find that at sba.gov forward slash updates. You put in your email address, and if you provide your zip code as well, you will be added to whatever is your local district office, their distribution list as well. So you can not only stay in touch with what's happening with the agency, but what's happening with your local district office um, too. We do have social media accounts. Um, the SBA is on Twitter. Um, we have our agency handle it at SBA gov. And for South Florida, I've highlighted our Twitter handle, which is at SBA underline South FL. And the agency as a whole has an Instagram account as well. You can find that instagram.com forward slash sba.gov. Now, the best way to reach our district office is through email. Um, our email address is South Florida, underline D like David, O like Oscar, at sba.gov. We do have a phone number, which is also highlighted on the screen, 305-536-5521. But as you can imagine, we're getting a lot of calls these days. So email tends to be the easiest way to reach us. Um, if you wanna leave your phone number on an email, we'll contact you back and, and have somebody from our office that is monitoring the emails um, reach out to you. Um, now, this particular program, the Restaurant Revitalization Fund and all of our other programs can be found in one website. We have one catch-all website for everything we're doing surrounding the coronavirus pandemic, which is sba.gov forward slash relief, which is the first one that's listed on the bottom of the screen. All of our economic aid options whether they're grant programs, loan programs, or payment programs are available on that landing page. However, if you wanna go specifically to a program, you can do um, for the Paycheck Protection Program, it's sba.gov forward slash PPP. For the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program and our payment program, it's sba.gov forward slash EIDL, E-I-D-L. And for the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant, sba.gov forward slash SVO grant. And remember, I don't have the restaurant one on the slide, but it's sba.gov forward slash restaurants. Um, I believe the next slide is just a thank you. So we can open it up if there's any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have any questions. You were pretty thorough oh. this time around as always. <laughs> We do like to have thorough slides, so. <laughs> yeah, I think you guys got a lot of things locked up this time as far as, you know, trying to uh, combat fraud as well. That's a good thing. We're, we're trying to, yeah. This was um, kind of modeled the rollout on the SVOG. So we're trying to do a big push of outreach ahead of time so that everyone will be able to be well-informed when they try to apply for the program, so yeah. And you said you don't have a target. You said you don't know the exact date of when the program is gonna roll out yet. I do not. Um, I think the anticipation is it will be by um, the end of the month, but I don't know exactly when it will happen. Because remember, we have that pilot pro period first for seven days, 
And then after that, it will be open up to accepting applications from everybody else. Okay. Uh, Pete, do you have any questions? Oh, yes. You know, I have questions. <laughs> I was uh, actually texting one of my uh, veteran friends that has a small restaurant, and uh, he's, he's looking Excellent. at applying really quick. But I do have a couple of questions, perhaps uh, clarifying some things. There is no SAMS registration, which is great uh, because I have also my brother-in-law, he's applying for SBO and that's, that's one headache off the, off the table. Right. Um, the other, the one question that I had, this is for venues, 20 venues or less, correct? Correct. 20 okay. venues or less. Because I was a little confused that it, it actually looked like if it was, you know, 20 venues or more and about the franchise, the franchise registration. Registry. Right. Right. The registry. Is it the register, the franchise or that registers or the franchise E that registers? It's the franchise or. Okay. Right. Good. The one so that owns the go. franchise itself. Right. They're the right. ones that have to register with SBA. And what we're okay. looking at there is typically the franchise agreement or the um, disclosure statement that they give to the FTC. Um, okay. Those are the type of documents they have to give to SBA. And what we're looking there for, Peter, is um, control. We want to make sure that um, any franchisee um, in mm -hmm. that uh, organization has the ability to profit or fail based on their own efforts. It, there's not a lot of control exerted on how they actually run their operation other than maybe, right. you know, um, very um, uh, generic marketing or something like that. But um, mm -hmm. they get to run their own operation and, and like I said, profit or fail based on their own efforts. So, Right. My buddy, he, he's in a, it's a small franchise. It's, uh, I think he's the fifth restaurant. And he was just interested, which one, you know, will he fall under? Um, if he goes to sba.gov and in our search engine, just put franchise registry, it's, okay. uh, it's like, I think it's a big Excel sheet, but you can um, search and see if your franchise is already listed on there. It's oh, actually great. public knowledge as to what's on oh, there that's and, even and better. what's not. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll let him know. That's good. And of course, you've gotten really good at this. So right now, the SBA, you're answering all my questions. Wait, I'm here taking notes and going, ah, oh, let me ask. I, she's got to know this, right? And then I'm like scratching it midway. I'm like, oh, that, that answers that question. So, yeah. Great job. And, and a great job again for everyone at the SBA. You guys are just, I mean, you're hitting home runs on all this. And I'm sure you're firing on all cylinders. Because oh, yeah. It's, it's been fun. I mean, I, I just <laughs> turned, uh, I didn't, uh, I don't think I was uh, on your last thing before I had my anniversary, but I just hit 30 years with the SBA. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> but I got to tell you, nothing has been like what we've been doing this, the last pandemic. I mean, uh, uh, relatively easy prior to that, I will say. Um, so if we have to spend a few more hours, you know, online helping small businesses right now, you know, we're not the ones with the uncertainty. We know we're going to get a paycheck every two weeks. So, you know, this is what we signed up for as public servants. And it's, it's what we're here for. We serve the public. So, yeah. Yeah, Happy we appreciate it. it. Tell you. Well, I appreciate you guys having me on. Um, you know, we're trying to, like I said, cast the widest net with information. And um, you guys allowing me on and allowing me to do the presentation is, is very, very helpful to us. Thank you. And we awesome. actually had somebody contact, uh, commu communicate with us last night saying how they appreciate the fact that we do these even though they can't necessarily be on the actual session live, right. but the fact that we record it and put it up posted somewhere, they say that helps them a lot. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. It's getting yeah. out there. Excellent. <laughs> well, All right. So any more questions, Peter? No, no. The, again, I've been scratching off my, my notepad here. I mean, it's, yeah, I start with uh, stickums all over the place and then I end up, you know, ripping them off and saying, Nope, it's not that. So. Excellent. I'm glad to know that it's answering the questions as we go along, because if it's, if it's answering your questions, Peter, I know it's answering the small business community as well. So thank you. Oh, I'm also, now I'm also texting at the same time. I'm like, <laughs> someone's got to have a question. <laughs> so bravo. Great job. Thank you. Oh, oh, hold on. There we go. There we go. Okay. Well, I just want to say thank you again for taking your time to help us, you know, get this information out to the community, especially to the rest of our owners, because who I know they're getting hit massively during this pandemic. So this is really important information for them. And we just want to invite everybody, everybody again to join us next week. I think next week. But every Thursday, we'll do Miss Talk Thursdays and we'll have a new topic we'll talk about trying to find ways to help accelerate your business and keep you guys in business. Uh, if you need to go back to our website to look at the recordings, you can go to startersunited.co and go under our blog and you'll find the perspective uh, recordings there. 
And you want to send us an email, you can send us an email at team at startupsunited.co. They'll get to us and we'll respond back. Thank you again for joining us and we'll see you next week.